August 8th, 2014, Scott Cawthon releases Five Nights at Freddy's, essentially a middle finger to the game journalists of his previous game, Chipper and Sons Lumber Company. They said that the characters looked like creepy animatronic dolls, causing Scott to say, you want animatronics? I'll give you animatronics. So what do I do? So the first night is never usually that bad in any of the games, so I'll play through. <laughs> she is such a bad <laughs> though. I will f the sh out of that robot, man. I'm not Then he casually created one of the most influential horror games, if not just one of the most influential games of the past decade. We still feel both the positive and negative effects of its release to this very day on the internet, and that's exactly the topic of this video. The ups and downs, the peaks and valleys, the boon and bane, I guess. The FNAF games themselves are great, widely accepted as the apex of horror at the time, and an incredible medium of implying a complex story that was much, much larger than initially expected. I'm strictly talking about Scott Cawthon's indie creations, of course, not security leak out my pants diary. But regardless, even as a youngin, first discovering the FNAF universe, I couldn't help but be intrigued. I remember sneaking in FNAF content by watching Venturian Tale, specifically their most viewed video, scariest horror map ever, exclamation point, exclamation point, Gmod, Five Nights at Freddy's map, Gary's mod. But as I've grown, and observing a lot of this fan base, I can say with a high degree of certainty that it would take years to even scratch the surface of FNAF content. And I can't wait to see how deep this animatronic rabbit hole goes. Let's begin, friends. Back in the formative years of FNAF, the bulk of its exposure came from YouTube. If you were a FNAF fan at the time, you were a Markiplier fan. Hello everybody, my name is Markiplier and welcome to Five Nights at Freddy- No, stop! What are you doing? What are you doing? What are you- No! As the part one of his FNAF series has over 100 million views, and if the YouTube landscape has taught me anything, monkey see, monkey do. FNAF is thriving on YouTube ever since its initial debut on the platform, and I'm certain that half of the community hasn't even beaten an official FNAF game. Just because it's so much easier and fun for some people to just watch Markiplier make strange faces and loud noises to the strange faces and loud noises on screen. But it's not just Let's Plays that blow up on YouTube, oh no no no. We've got fan animations, fan music, game analyses, fan game analyses, game theories, lore explanations, VHS tapes, porn. Let's not talk about that last part. But I will talk about how songs like Break My Mind, Join Us For A Bite, and the FNAF musical have view counts in the tens and hundreds of millions. And I'm not even going to talk about The Living Tombstone's Five Nights at Freddy's one song, which has 200 and 87 million views. If I ever make a video that gets to 200,000 views, I would consider my YouTube career a success. There's no way Living Tombstone would be able to follow this up with an even comparably popular song for the sequel. I could do an entire video on how popular FNAF songs are, but I've got to move on. Next, I want to talk about game, game theory. theory. Watch your calories. Don't you tell me how many calories I need. I definitely would consider this a very positive aspect of the FNAF community. As I mentioned before, the games are a great medium for deep lore, and you could most likely play these games just for gameplay and not even think about the lore at all. But if you look deeper at stuff like Easter eggs, character design, and mini games, there's an incredibly intriguing story taking place just under the surface. And it is much, much darker than just some animatronic bear. I won't get into the lore here, although if you clicked on this video, you most likely know about it. And if you do know about it, chances are you were learning about it from this guy. 
Matthew Patrick, or Matt Pat, from the channel Game Theory. As of writing this video, Game Theory has over 60 videos on Five Nights at Freddy's theories. The view counts of these videos range from about 4 million to 30 million views. These videos have been coming out over the past 8 years and they consistently get millions of views. This is because FNAF and its story is, and probably always will be, popular. FNAF, ever since its initial release, pretty much always has at least one project in the works, whether it's a game, books, or now a movie. But the lore itself is popular because it's not easily understood when taken at face value, but a decent understanding of the lore is achievable through some research and watching explanation videos, which it seems lots and lots of fans tend to do. I mean, the main villain's name wasn't even verbally spoken until the fifth game. She can dance. She can sing. She's equipped with a built-in helium tank for inflating balloons right at her fingertips. She can take song requests. She can even dispense ice cream. With all due respect, those aren't the design choices we were curious about, Mr. Afton. But back when the lore wasn't made quite as whole, honestly still really isn't, we could always rely on game theory to assemble the pieces for us. You could say, he put it back together. So far I've only spoken on things from several years ago, but there's definitely some great content from modern FNAF. One of the popular ones is the VHS tapes. Several different creators have worked on a myriad of different analog horror series, typically their interpretations of the lore, but likely the most popular and my personal favorite is called Squimpus McGrimpus. Before I continue, apparently there is drama surrounding this creator as of March 17th. I don't know much about this situation, so moving forward, I will be separating art from artist. The series that I watched in relation to this was the Baddington series, the remake of this. This series of analog horror videos is meant to represent the lore in a new light, and it just goes to show the constant creativity coming from this community. Now looking back on the original games, they've kind of lost their fear factor. I'm just gonna reboot everything, you know. <laughs> I'm real bad at this. God, I'm bad Not at that they're necessarily poorly made, but more so that they've been so oversaturated. I'm sure I'd still be creeped out by playing them. They're very well designed, but the actual unsettled feeling it would ensue is kind of gone. That's the feeling that the analog series gives, sort of breathing new life into the best parts of the series. Which, as much as I love Scott's contribution to the series, it's sort of out of his hands nowadays. The last well-received FNAF game was about four years ago, so ever since since then, it's kind of been in the hands of the fans to continue its legacy. Another inspiration for this video was my recent viewing habits. Great content creators like Oh Yeah and Plain Trace. Their content tends to vary, but most often they talk about FNAF fan games. That's right, you're watching a video on videos on video games about other video games. Which is kind of the crazy thing. These creators have been able to essentially make a career out of talking about just the fan games of this one series. The sheer amount of fan games this series generates is insane. Game Jolt has its own subsection dedicated to FNAF because of the massive number of fan games that get uploaded to it on a regular basis. And they're not of low quality either. In fact, several games that get uploaded to the site are probably of higher quality than some of the original games. Maybe all of the original games. I personally believe one of the two main reason so many get made is the simplicity of the original games. Click Team Fusion is a simple game engine that most creators use to get started on making these awesome fan creations. It allows them to create something comparable to the FNAF series line of games. For example, imagine trying to make a fan version of a AAA release like Red Dead Redemption. It has a fan base arguably just as dedicated, but they can't easily just make a 60 hour minimum story with an enormous interweaving open world that all takes place in a faithful recreation of the old west. But a 2D horror game with a few levels, that's a bit more easily doable. And when they're done well, which happens fairly often, they get popular. Games like The Joy of Creation and Five Nights at Candy's get popular enough to have merch of them made. Pepita, don't turn me into marketable plushies. Which leads me to my second point. I think it's easier to make fan games of this series simply because the creator of FNAF seems to put a major emphasis on fan interaction. There are many events and reasons showing this, but specifically, I want to talk about the Fanverse initiative. It's almost showing us that he's pretty much aware that the fans know what they're doing and how to make a great FNAF game. As sad as it is to say, the direction Steel Wolf Studios has taken the series is controversial at best. 
Here's hoping the movie will be a good official take on the series, but it seems that lately the enjoyment of this series has been in the hands of its fans. I mean, there are several channels dedicated to talking about fan projects for crying out loud, and the fans only make great stuff. Right? Right? Okay, this is the part of the video where I talk about the negative side. Why FNAF is the best, worst fan base. Back when FNAF came out in 2014, it was kind of the internet's best friend, but an unintentional consequence of this is it was very quickly overrun by... Ugh, children. Huh? To the dismay of many, lots of kids have total unmonitored access to the internet. And with the nostalgically scary yet colorfully designed animal characters, these kids went nuts. They seemed obsessed with the idea of these dead child possessed robots having personalities and lives and relationships with one another. This is pretty much the basis of most of what I hate about the community. That's right. Hate. We're getting hateful today. <laughs> I do want to clarify, this isn't all just kids doing this, but I do seem to notice through my research this is where most of this stuff seems to stem from. When FNAF first came out, it was pretty much the catalyst that ended up creating the idea of mascot horror, which has a slew of its own issues, but long story short, I would say mascot horror is just horror for kids. Think Benny the Ink Machine and Hello Neighbor, games that range in quality, have a game theory made about them, and have at least one iconic central character. Kids just eat that stuff up. Although there's a problem there, they always eat it up too quick. Creators can only make so much content for their IP, and when these certain fans haven't gotten their proper dose of popular franchise, sometimes they make more themselves. A major example of this can be seen with the Undertale fanbase. There are literally dozens, maybe hundreds, of fan-made alternate universes that have been made to fill the hole that lack of game releases from Toby Fox leaves that fanbase. This results in some music, games, art, animations, and comics all related to these AUs. Some good, and some really, really, really bad. This is the case with pretty much every indie game that becomes popular nowadays, especially with mascot horror, and it's not necessarily a bad thing. Fan content can be genuinely fantastic, but it's nearly impossible to ignore how awful the waste can be. It's kind of like how nuclear power plants can be. We have the energy and we have the waste. And even though this happens with most communities of this nature, FNAF was again, the catalyst. FNAF was the first, and it's had plenty of time to fester. I was the first. I have seen everything. FNAF has been around for a while, so it's had a decent amount of time to have cringe content made of it. But sometimes it's just that. It's just cringe. Maybe art of the characters uncomfortably close, or William Afton a bit more youthful than you'd expect him to look, but some content goes much, much further than this. I searched the term FNAF fan art, a pretty innocuous term, and I'm on Google search, so there's no way it could possibly <laughs> Fun fact, every image I showed on screen here was what I found with safe search on. I did not have to dig very deep to find all the content being shown in this video. A decent chunk of it, I didn't even scroll down at all. The most difficult part was gaining the willpower to allow this content on my computer during editing. And I'm sure this rabbit hole runs way, way deeper, but I would feel morally reprehensible if I went to some of the sites containing this content. Clearly, I could go on for a while talking about the more deprived segments of the community, but there's more I want to discuss in this more negative part of the video, specifically one major sin of this fan base. June 16th, 2021, Scott Cawthon's retirement. Don't get me wrong, if Scott was truly done and wanted to move on to a new chapter of his life, then he absolutely can and should. 
more power to him. But in case you weren't aware, the thing that caused him to do this was a controversy that surrounded him at the time. To make a long story short, it leaked that Scott had donated to some right-leaning politicians, one of which being the ever-hated Orange Man. I'm gonna come! If you want more information on this, then I highly recommend that you watch the video on the Game Theorist channel, where MatPat himself talks about the details and pretty much weighs the pros and cons. Now, I really don't want to get political on this channel, so go. whether or not you are still willing to support Mr. Coffin is up to you. But what I'm going to be focusing on is the poor behavior exhibited by a portion of the fan base before his retirement. And I want to emphasize, this is a very select portion of the fan base. It wasn't an execution or anything like that. But I say this because there's one detail I left out, a major detail. It wasn't just his donations that got leaked, but also his private information, including his address. I live at 308 Negra Arroyo Lane, Albuquerque, New Mexico, 871. Due to the docs, people literally threatened to use that information to hurt or even kill him and his family. From my understanding, that was the threat. Now, Scott had a very good response to this, in my opinion, on Reddit. It's very long, but I want to read the end for you here. Quote, if I get canceled, then I get canceled. I don't do this for the money anymore, I do it because I enjoy it. I would accept that. I've had a fulfilling career. I have always loved and will continue to love this community and this fan base, even if someday it doesn't include me anymore. There was a mixed response to this, but then Scott uploaded a letter announcing his retirement, which had a much more positive overall message. Regardless of how you feel about his actions, Scott is an amazing individual. He didn't apologize for his actions just because he was caught. He explained why he took these stances that he took. And in his retirement letter, he managed to end it on a happier note, not being spiteful to the jerks who tried to bully him out of the community, but looking back on the great things he's done and looking forward to what he will be doing. For the community, I believe there is peace and perhaps more waiting for us after the smoke clears. Although for some of you, the darkest pit of hell has opened to swallow you whole. So don't keep the devil waiting, old friends. Scott, if you can hear me, I hope you're well. It's in your nature to make great content. <laughs> this is really cringe. I'm sorry that on that day, the day you were shut out and left to die, no one was there to lift you up into their arms the way you lifted others into yours. And then, what became of you? We should have known you wouldn't be content to disappear. Not my Scott. I couldn't save you then, so let me save you now. It's time to rest. For you, and for those you've carried in your arms, this ends for all of us. End communication. FNAF came out when I was around 9 to 10 years old, and I was introduced to it not long after it came out. This just means that FNAF grew up with me. I was intrigued by the dim visuals and the eerily nostalgic sounds of FNAF as a kid, and continued to engage with it as I grew up seeing the new releases and learning all about the lore. I even grew up to date a wonderful girl who loves the series just as much, if not more than I do. As a FNAF kid, teen, and now adult, I've observed a decent chunk of this community, and I really love it even though I just went on talking about the sins of the fanbase. But I agree with Scott when in his retirement letter, he described the fanbase as, quote, possibly the most creative and talented fanbase on the planet. Thinking about it, I struggle to disagree with this. On top of the amazingly crafted fan games, there are several viral videos of people in these amazing animatronic costumes or even just straight up actual robots with moving parts and faceplates. There are countless examples of the creativity and talent of these people, regardless of the awful cringe things I discussed earlier. For every Springtrap Vore burping video, there's a hundred amazing fan creations, be they a game, drawing, animation, or song, I'm certain if official FNAF stopped, every future project was entirely cancelled, that it would still gladly live on through fan creations. And that's why FNAF is the best, worst, community. Thank you for watching.